Welcome to the next frontier where imagination, innovation, technology, and new ideas come together to radically revolutionize your quality of life and to change the world around us for the better. All right, here today with uh, Gloria Allred. I am so thrilled to be here with you. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, you've you've got such such an illustrious career. You know, I've been uh, studying and looking back and reading through your uh, books, mm -hmm. the commentary about you on uh, multiple multiple media outlets mm -hmm. now, and. Uh, you've been a uh, feminist, a victim's rights advocate for how many years now? That's almost 40 years. Almost I've been a civil rights, victim's rights attorney. Wow. That's, uh, and you've done, uh, you've worked with cases, everything from, uh, did you have something to do with O.J. Simpson? You did. You represented Nicole Brown Simpson? I represented the family. Oh, the family. Of the uh, deceased, Nicole the deceased. Brown Simpson. Correct. And in the criminal case. Got it. Oh, in the criminal case, did yes. you? Mm -hmm. Wow. That, that boy, that was a tough one. That's uh, when you've got uh, you know everything against you, and I, it kind of it kind of brings me to the theme that I'd like to touch on here for our, our conversation is is that it seems to me that uh, all these cases that you've done over the years have been David versus Goliath type cases. Um, would you would that be an accurate assessment? Or? Absolutely accurate. Yeah. We represent the individual against the rich, the powerful, the famous. Uh, institutions, uh, government, large corporations, small businesses, and we seek to fight back and win. Right. And that's, uh, to me, I, you know, it just seems to me that sometimes it's, you're up against impossible odds. And I know your book, that's Fight Back and Win. That was the name of your book, wasn't it? Uh, that uh, is the name of close. my book, Fight uh, Back and Win, My 30-Year Fight Against Injustice and How You Can Win Your Own Battles. See, and that's the, that's the thing is because um, injustice and justice and then winning your own battles, um, you know, if you don't mind, maybe I'll go back and start a little bit. What, what prompted your decision to get into all of this, if, if you wouldn't mind sharing? Well, I was a teacher, uh -huh. and uh, then I became a credentialed high school principal, and uh, I was very interested in education, and I ended up going to law school. And in law school, uh, I decided that uh, I, I just wanted to take a different path, and ultimately, I was very blessed to be able to meet my law school classmates and persuade them to go into law practice with me. Oh, so you grabbed them together and you went uh, out and joined? Uh, Nathan started. Goldberg, who was number one in our class at Loyola Law School. He's, he's still a partner, isn't he? And Michael yeah. Morocco, uh, still who a was very, very high up in the class. And I sat down with them and uh, asked them to go into law practice with me. And uh, they said, do you know anyone? I said, I don't know anyone, and no one knows me. And they said, well, where will the clients come from? I said, we're going to put good out into the world, and good will come the back to us. Come, and yeah. maybe not from that particular case, but just because we're going to put good out into the world. And so they went into practice with me, and we've been together almost 40 years. That, and, of course, we've added partners and associates. Yeah, that's amazing. A 40-year relationship that's worked for 40... I mean, that's almost unheard of. Uh, it is. <laughs> uh, and uh, I'm responsible for every gray hair on their heads. Ah, and I was going to say, you don't have any. Uh, well, so. <laughs> <laughs> I do. You just can't see them. But oh, okay. having said that, uh, <laughs> they have been extremely supportive of me. And uh, just reminds me of the saying that we have in the women's movement that a man of quality is not threatened by a woman of equality. And I've been very blessed to have them in my life because they're outstanding, exceptional lawyers. They are very dedicated to women's rights and to civil rights for minorities who have been denied their rights in the past, like racial minorities, uh, individuals who've been discriminated against on account of their sexual orientation uh, or their condition of AIDS, or on account of their age, uh, their ethnic origin, uh, or any other classification over which they have no control. So I'm very, very fortunate that we're still in practice together. And we are the leading women's rights law firm in the, in the nation, private law firm. And we've won, you know, maybe a quarter of a billion dollars over the time that we have been practicing for victims. And for our clients, we're 
pioneers in the area of gay and lesbian rights and transgender rights. We've been doing those cases since the late 1970s, early 1980s. Uh, and we have one precedent wow, setting it's... decisions. And that was at a time you when- You were doing it before it was popular. <laughs> it was very unpopular. Right. A lot of people were afraid to do them because they didn't want to be labeled lesbian or gay if they represented individuals who were lesbian and gay. But um, I didn't see that as an issue. Right. I was very proud to stand up with those individuals who have, were denied their rights, who were denied equal protection of the law because I just felt that you know, they're entitled to the same rights as everyone else. And none of us can enjoy equal rights if they are denied their rights. It's like uh, Martin Luther King Jr., a threat to justice anywhere is a th threat to justice everywhere. Well, that's true. And, yeah. you know, and, and I start my book with the Gandhi quote that you must be the change you wish to see in the world. Right. So I thought if those individuals were courageous enough to want to assert their rights and vindicate their rights, then I have a duty to be supportive of them. And that's what we did. I, to me, it's just how you think about when you when you stand in the face of the fire, because I can imagine that when you've got deep pockets that you're fighting against or standing up against, uh, who are not necessarily hindered by uh, something being illegal or, uh, you know, the, the methods that they use will not always have ecological boundaries, <laughs> you know, the, yes. they're, they're willing to do whatever it takes to win, including well, that's true. intimidation, including, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, how does somebody who's, who's been a victim of injustice and they've got, they've got all the odds stacked up against them. How do they possibly have a chance to win? Well, that's where they have to have a legal team in right. support of them. And uh, we have together been able to win great victories. And the opponents uh, know that we can go on for years if necessary. I, I went on for 23 years. I had one of the original cases against the Catholic Church on behalf in the 1980s, wow. where we uh, sued uh, the Archdiocese of Los Angeles and seven Catholic priests whom we had alleged uh, sexually abused uh, uh, our client, seven Catholic priests, and she'd become pregnant by one of them. And on the day that we filed the lawsuit and held the news conference, they suddenly fled and went into hiding. And uh, no so I pursued that case for 23 years relentlessly. Uh, and finally, uh, the church settled and we opened up the whole priest sexual abuse scandal uh, in this country. And and recently found out that uh, there were even discussions in the Vatican uh, about our case because that was revealed through their files. Um, in any case, we know we know we will go for as long as it takes. We'll go the distance, you know, if that is going to accomplish our clients' goals. And our clients' goals are the most important. Right. And we have won cases, uh, three cases in the, in the California Supreme Court. Um, and... Uh, I guess maybe it was two, but we've been there three times, and the third one had to do with Prop 8. It all starts to meld together, doesn't uh, yes. it? Yes, <laughs> and then, uh, but we've won in the California Supreme Court. We've won precedent-setting decisions in the United States Court of Appeals uh, and in many other courts. So the bottom line is the opponents know that we're very serious lawyers, and we will do whatever it takes that's legal and peaceful to assert and win rights for our clients who've been denied their rights. The, um, did, didn't the Catholic Church uh, recently, did they uh, reverse their views on the priesthood and whether they could be married or have relationships? Do you know anything about uh, that? I, as far as I know, the Catholic Church well, still does not yeah. allow priests to marry. I thought, no, I thought there was something that was reversed. Well, I, I mean, it, it's a lot of lip service, but you yeah. know, we're interested in action. It's, you know, as the suffragists said, deeds, not words. Right. So let's see the action. Let's. Ah. But that's, you know, that's that's the subject for another time. What I was interested in was pre-sexual abuse. Right. And, uh, you know, the taking advantage of children. For sure. But when when you look at one thing leading to another, and yes, the, 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 right. You know, if you if you well, were to when make, you peel the onion back, there's like more and more layers and more and more right. things you have to look into. But for us, from a legal point of view, right, it was uh, the injustice. 
you know, sure. against our client. I was thinking that there's a legacy to the injustice that you fight also that can be a, a kind of a ripple effect from there that uh, Well, there is a ripple effect. If yeah. you look at, I mean, for example, one of the early gay and lesbian rights cases we did, famous case, Papa Shoe, where we represented two lesbian life partners who wanted to uh, have uh, dinner in the romantic section of uh, Papa Shoe Restaurant. This was early 1980s here in Los Angeles. And uh, they made a reservation. They went in uh, to Papa Shoe to celebrate Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday. Uh, and one was African-American, one was Latina. And, uh, and they were told after they were seated they had to move to another section of the restaurant because that was for couples only. And that they said that was a house policy. Uh, in other words, only opposite sex couples in the romantic right. section, and they didn't want to move, so then they asked for the owner of the restaurant who uh, reportedly uh, came by and s said, well, there is a city law, there's a city ordinance that uh, prohibits two people of the same sex from sitting in the romantic section of the restaurant. They could sit anywhere else in the restaurant, but not in that section. So they said that, well, we're businesswomen, but we don't think there is such a city <laughs> law. And then they, they said later, well, we talked to each other and decided what should we do? What would Martin Luther King Jr. want us to do? And they said he would want us to call Gloria Allred. So they did. <laughs> and they came in That's and great. we had to decide, well, is that uh, a trivial matter or is that an important civil rights matter? And we decided if this is, if you think that Rosa Parks having to sit in the back of the bus was just about a bus ride, and nothing else, well, then you think this is just about a booth in a restaurant. But if you think that equal rights in a business, um, equal service, being treated with respect and dignity matter, then this is an important civil rights case for lesbians and gays. So we took it. And um, I'm very happy to say that uh, we won in a court of appeals. And uh, it was a precedent-setting case, and we've been that no business can discriminate against a person who is gay and lesbian. And we were able to cite that oh, as a precedent, our own precedent, in cases later on. Right. So we've had and many, many others could do the same. Oh, uh, we've yeah. had many other cases like that. Uh, you so know, there's not just the a ripple 80s, effect; there's the a 90s. tidal wave effect. Yeah, that, we uh, had a big AIDS discrimination case in the, in the 80s uh, against Jessica's nail salon. Fought that one for 16 years, and we ultimately won two precedent-setting decisions in the Court of Appeals. We fought that even after our client, Paul Jasperson, passed away. May he rest in peace. And um, upheld the West Hollywood City Ordinance, prohibits businesses from discriminating against persons who are perceived to be HIV positive or have AIDS. And, uh, and we also won a precedent-setting decision that even after the client has passed away, in these kinds of circumstances, we can still win an injunction. That was a, a precedent. When and you, so we, you know, we, we, we were out there early, often, and continue to be, uh, you know, all, all the way up to the marriage case. Of course, we were the first in California to announce that we would challenge the ban on same-gender marriage, in other words, on marriage equality, for same-sex couples if our clients uh, were denied a marriage license in the Beverly Hills Courthouse, which they were, and then we filed a lawsuit, went up to the Supreme Court of California and won the right to marry. Did you, uh, let's let's see, I'm, I'm not a statement about your age at all, but did, did you meet Martin Luther King Jr.? Did you ever have a chance? I actually hear? didn't meet Martin yeah. Luther King Jr. However, I recently, uh, on Martin Luther King Jr. Day this yeah. year, um, was did a news conference and a panel and met his son. No kidding. Martin Luther King III at the National Trial Lawyers Conference. Was that meaningful for you? Or? It was meaningful. Yeah. And um, so much so because also, and I think I, I mentioned this to him, that when I was in college, which was way back in, in the cave age, but, you know, it no, really I, I, was, we, we, You walked in the room and we said, yeah. Faith looks over at <laughs> our producer, she's like, Oh, well, like, thank you. Oh, yeah, oh thank like, you. Yeah. Not in bad shape for the shape I'm in, but when I was in college <laughs> in 1963, I was in the Honors in English program at the University of Pennsylvania. I had to do a dissertation, and I, I said to the professor, uh, Professor Chester, uh, who was the chair of our honors program, I said, I'd like to do my dissertation on, on African-American 
authors, novelists. And he said, well, why would you want to do that? I said, because I've never read anything by an African-American author. And he said, well, they haven't written anything worth reading. I said, well, Professor, I, w I guess I won't know that unless I read them. And he said, well, you'll take a risk then. You may not get honors in English if you do that. I said, I'll take the risk. Huh. So I took the risk just because I was intellectually curious. Sure. And, uh, and then I submitted my dissertation. And everybody else got honors in English, and I heard nothing. And then a few weeks later, James Baldwin appeared on the cover of Time magazine, and I won honors in English. Wow. Yeah. We've got to take a break right now. But we're, <laughs> that, that, it's such a perfect, uh, perfect place, but we'll be right back. When you think of heroes... Um, I have to say later, yeah. if I may. Please. Oh, good. Do you want to continue Piggyback the on that. Yeah, please. Years later, uh, I had done my dissertation on, on uh, James Baldwin, Alex Haley, and Ralph Ellison. Years later, I came to represent the wife and then later the widow of Alex Haley and actually went to his funeral wow. in the South, sat in front of his coffin on, outside in a big field, a tent, with thousands of people there. And it just gave me chills that so much, so many years earlier, I'd actually written him, written about him in my dissertation. So, yeah, it's been a fascinating civil rights battle. Let me ask you, what's important to you about all that, about the civil rights What's movement? important to me is, you know, I, I just feel blessed to be able to help people to enforce their rights and to win the, the rights that they deserve to have. It's, it's a great battle. It continues, by the way, today. Yeah. In 2015, uh, you know, even... More challenges, yeah. It, I mean, we have not won our rights. I mean, obviously, we have uh, the marriage equality battle, as soon to be before the U.S. Supreme Court, um, and uh, I'll be going to that. Hmm. And hopefully be able to, to be able to watch that argument. And I'm going to be with, uh, there with uh, two attorneys and the clients whose marriage equality case from Michigan, is going to be before the court. Uh, and I had them here in my office. We we did a news conference together uh, just within the last month or so. And um, I I'm just very supportive of them and I want to hear the arguments. I was be able, I was there when the Prop Eight. Uh, argument was was argued before the U.S. Supreme Court. So it's very exciting to see how far we've come, but we still have a long, long way to go. We have a long way to go for women's rights you know, because women are still being sexually harassed, they're being sexually abused, they're being economically discriminated against, they're victims of violence. You know my whole involvement in, yeah. the, in the Bill Cosby yes, I've uh, seen, yeah. uh, issue where more than 40 women uh, allege have come forward publicly and alleged that they have either been drugged or sexually assaulted or both. And when you sit down with these women, because you have, uh, you know, you have a sense of what's real, of looking, so like when I look at you and I see the emotion in your face and I see your, your skin color changes when you talk about uh, civil rights and how important it is to you. And I, so I, I, I read you in a different, like I know that sometimes people can come under attack. I watched a couple of video interviews where reporters were attacking you for various things and you know they would classify you or put you into a, a box of being somebody who is uh, you know, not an, well, an ambulance chaser in this context, but you throw that away and I'm looking at you going, hey, you're somebody who cares deeply about civil rights, much in the same way that an MLK would care deeply about civil rights. And when you sit in front of these uh, women on the Bill Cosby thing and you have conversations with them, this, this is the real deal. Yeah. I mean, first of all, I mean, the suffragists and Martin Luther King Jr., may he rest in peace, yeah. they were all attacked so much more viciously than I've been attacked. So, you know, I, I always consider, I guess I must be doing something important if people think... If they're that, out attacking, uh, right. Uh, they need to attack the, me. Right. And uh, so that's just the it's nature of civil... Fox News, I saw. Well, it's the nature <laughs> of, of civil rights right. uh, that... You know, you're going to be attacked. It's not for the, the faint of, of, of heart. It is for people who are willing to be warriors, who are willing to be fearless. And, I mean, the suffragists said uh, that women who are not willing to risk the displeasure of men 
are never going to win anything significant for women's rights. And that's I read some paraphrase, but it's pretty close. Yeah. And that's true. And, um, you know, you have to be willing to give it and, and also take it. But I also say if they're calling me names, then actually that's a good thing because that means they have no argument. Uh, if they had a good argument, they would give it. And if they resorted to calling me by my genital parts, um, then it, it means that they're, they just don't have a good argument. So this is the way it is. I'm not a politician. I'm a civil rights attorney. I'm not a philosopher. You know, I'm out there in the war zone. For women, we live in a war zone. And there's a lot of bleeding on the war zone war zone path and you know a lot of people are being hurt and I gotta, gotta carry them across while you know the bullets are flying so to speak but and you, this is the way it is and for anybody you know it's like doing heart surgery if you don't like blood this is not the the, the path for you to be a surgeon well, I, well, I'm you used say to you're not a philosopher though you, I mean it sounds like there's a deep philosophy and there's a deep uh, there's a deep uh, what do I want to say? A deep consciousness behind what it is that you're doing. It's it not is. just that you got yes. into law and yeah. you're fighting cases. You're I guess what I mean is the, I admire Gloria Steinem and she really has a philosophy of the movement. And, but what I'm saying is I'm more of the general who's out there in the, in the war zone and uh, it is a war zone for women. And when you attack the rich and the powerful and the famous, when you attack institutions, when you want to win change, because status quo is what people are comfortable with. But when you want to get out there and win change, when you name names, when you say, we're going to have to have it, we're going to have to have it now. They're coming after you. They're coming after you. So that's fine. But there's a reason where they're in, why there are not a lot of women lawyers out there doing what we're doing. It's not easy. It's not easy, and they don't know how to do it. But I am actually working with women lawyers throughout the country now. We have a national practice now. I have an office in New York. Uh, I'm working uh, with a, a woman lawyer and her firm there. Uh, I have uh, cases in Connecticut and New Jersey and Texas and Florida, all, all over the country now, and I'm constantly. And, and so we're building this wonderful women lawyer network and male lawyers as well. Um, and this is what I want to continue long after I'm no longer physically on this planet because I want everyone to have access to their rights. So we're doing, for example, a lot of Title IX cases, women who are rape and sexual assault victims at their colleges and the colleges who have a duty to support them and help them to learn their rights and help them to have hearings against the uh, perpetrators or the accused uh, who are accused of rape and sexual assault often are not doing what they should do for their college students who are uh, reporting these the, these acts of violence against them. So we are going up against those institutions, and we just recently, you know, won on behalf of five rape and sexual assault victims, one point three million dollars against the University of Connecticut. We've had cases elsewhere. Uh, we will continue to have cases in that area. So. You know, there's women have higher expectations now in 2015 that everything is going to be great, but it's not. Their lives, for many of them, they they can't get an abortion because it's not legal or it's not safe or they're too it's too burdened or or doctors are threatened and being you know assassinated or healthcare providers are having their clinics burned. So. They're being denied their rights. You know, they're victimized by acts of violence. There's economic discrimination, family law, where so many single mothers can't get their child support or can't get it on time or in the amount that was ordered. Or now, is, is, is your focus primarily in the United States, or do you take... I really am limited myself to the United States. Right. I've, I've done some international cases. I did a big case in, in, in Italy years ago, um, but and that's in my book. In 48 hours, did a whole hour about it, about a child who was kidnapped by her father and the mother was killed. And I went to Italy and fought to get the child back, which I did. But um, Gotta choose your it was, uh, I, I, I'm limiting myself to the United yeah. States now because I, I, 
you know, there is just no time to do anything anywhere else, although there are a lot of wrongs, a lot of injustices for worldwide sure. against women. Yeah, for sure. You know, I read someplace that uh, Martin, Martin Luther King Jr. had up to 60 death threats a day. You know, uh, I think it was J. Edgar Hoover uh, wrote him the letter that said, if you don't commit suicide, we're going to talk about the fact that you're a philanderer. And uh, so there's so much opposition that comes in. Do you find that in today's day and age, with technology and with uh, new means of uh, accosting victims, that intimidation uh, takes new forms? Well, there's a lot of cyberbullying, obviously. But... Um the question is, how are you going to deal with all that? Right. I mean, with me, I just, you know, I, I just keep keep on keeping on. Yeah, that's got to be difficult. So, um, you know. Do, I, you, do you get intimidation still? The, the, I'm saying? never intimidated. Right. I mean, do I get threats? <laughs> uh, do I get threats? Probably, yes. I mean, so therefore what? I mean, I, I'm not going to let that stop me. I mean, if you're going to do, if you're going to be intimidated, you don't belong doing what we're doing. Right. Um, and so, no, I'm just going to, nothing is going to stop Nothing's me. Of course, I'm cautious. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I've always said to my grandchildren, even when they were little and when they were concerned about, you know, especially when I was going to Italy against the man who had killed uh, the mother of this little child. Um, you know, better a short life with courage than a long life in fear. And that's how I feel. So, but I've been fortunate to do this for many years. I hope to be able to do it for many years to come. And I'm very too. fortunate. I have a, a wonderful <laughs> daughter uh, who is a lawyer. She, she looks much like you, too. Oh, She's I should. Uh, the, yeah. I, I, it's she looks so much better than I do. Well, the, Lisa the, Bloom, yes. and now I'm fortunate... Uh, my granddaughter is about to be graduated from law school wow. as well yeah, next month. So we're going to have three generations of women lawyers. So she's going the same direction. She's taking the same Well, path. I mean, I hope that one day she'll work in the area of women's rights and civil rights. She's yeah. going to have to carve out her own path. And Lisa does, doesn't she? Uh, Lisa does, yeah, yeah, but I'm talking about my granddaughter. Your granddaughter now, yes. Uh, so and what's her name? Her, my granddaughter's name is Sarah. Sarah, uh-huh. Sarah Bloom, and uh, she's... Uh, Another one that we don't have the fear gene in our family. It kind of missed us. <laughs> and uh, she says, Grandma, I'm, I'm a rebel. I said, that's no surprise, Sarah. I said, you come from a long line of rebels. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Why wouldn't you be? Now, was she, I, I'm wondering if they were tough when they were growing up. Were they rebels when they were growing up, well, too? Well, I think it... Sarah's been a little bit uh, of a rebel, yeah. But she's <laughs> terrific, a wonderful right. young woman. I'm very proud of her. In fact, I'm going to take her. And try to get her into the United States Supreme Court with me. She's planning to go with me wow. uh, on April 28th That's fantastic. when the court uh, has its argument scheduled. It's going to be very tough to get in there that day. Yeah, I bet. I did take her to the uh, Prop 8 arguments. And uh, I just think, you know, this is history. Yeah. And she needs to be part of it. And hopefully she's going to be inspired and want to help others to assert their rights. Because... Yeah, you know, I really feel this is what we have a duty to do. There are not many women in this world who have the privilege of becoming a lawyer. So I feel that if we have been given that privilege, afforded that, that we need to make sure that we fulfill our duty to not only our families but our communities, to others who have not been so fortunate to be able to achieve what we have achieved and and until others are successful, we can't consider ourselves successful. We just have a duty to help them fight injustice. I, I was going to ask you earlier uh, who, who your heroes were. And I know you wrote papers and we talked about that a little bit. But who were people that you really looked up to in terms of uh, either activists or civil rights activists that, were, that helped to change and mold uh, maybe the, the country but also the world? Well, I mean, I guess my heroes are Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony because that battle... Uh, to win the right to vote for women was a very, very difficult battle. And the Pankhurst in England, who fought that battle. Um, and many of those early suffragists were jailed. Uh, some were forcibly fed, and some, uh, some died. Uh, one woman just threw herself in front of a horse uh, in England 
uh, to attract attention to the fact that women didn't enjoy the right to vote in England. And, and, and when was this? She literally sacrificed her life, and people don't know that. And then, you know, families were broken up. I, I have photos of suffragists in my office, and these were very, very courageous women who were called all kinds of names. So, you know, I know what it is uh, to have to fight for rights, but, you know, what they suffered is far more than what I suffer. I mean, I remember when I tried to uh, integrate the Friars Club in New York, which is a private club. It was an all-male club. Uh, and uh, I became the first woman member of the Friars Club here in California, and then I wanted to use the New York Club uh, because male California Friars could have lunch there. And when I tried to have lunch there, they wouldn't let me. They said no women until after 4 o'clock. This was in the 80s. And I said, well, that's not acceptable to me. It's a little late for <laughs> lunch for me. <laughs> and uh, they said, well, we don't even let our wives in or secretaries. I said, well, uh, just think of me as a California friar. I need to have lunch there. <laughs> and they said no. So I went to go in anyway. And, you know, I was called all kinds of names throughout through the windows. And um, anyway, I filed a complaint of discrimination against them, gender discrimination by a private club in the city of New York. They found that I was discriminated against on account of my gender. The Supreme Court then uh, issued a decision on a Monday upholding the New York City law prohibiting gender discrimination. I went back. Uh, well, and, th and then I called and I said, well, did you hear about the Supreme Court decision? And the maitre d' said, yes. I said, can I have lunch there now? And they sa he said, no. I said, well... I'm going to be flying all night on a red eye from Los Angeles to New York just to have lunch there tomorrow. So please have my table ready at noon. And then I hung up and I got in the plane and I went. And I got off the plane and I called a news conference and I, I went up to the front door of the Friars Club. Henny Youngman, who was like the most famous burlesque comic of his time, came out, tried to stop me from going in. People, there were men standing at the windows calling me names. Uh, and then I asked him... And then I said to Mr. Youngman, you're not going to stop progress for women. I am going in. I, I brushed by him, went in, and I said to the maitre d', as I said yesterday, I'm here for my uh, lunch. Is my table ready? And he said, yes, it is. And I became the first woman to have lunch at the Friars Club in New York. In settlement of my complaint against them, I required them to open up the club to women for membership and for lunch and ultimately uh, for other purposes as well. And fast forward years later, the head of the club uh, said to me, I apologize to you. We should never have called you names. You were right. This is a better and stronger club because you made us take women as members. And uh, we thank you for it. We get a pause right there one more time for a break, but uh, awesome. Good place, to, good place to stop. <laughs> Quick question that just popped into my mind. Uh, Emma Watson, the young girl from Harry Potter, was just uh, with the UN, and I, I guess they made her uh, the representative of, I think it's women's rights and uh, in the UN. Are you familiar with the story at all? Or? No. Okay. <laughs> then I won't ask you that one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she's a, a lovely young girl that's just come out, and she's really spoken up for, uh, mm -hmm. for women. I mean, well, I mean, I like Emma Watson, so that's... I you mean, watched I'm, Harry Potter. I'm, I'm happy if we... You know, if we care about women's rights and stand up for them, that's a good thing. Anybody <laughs> who says that they do is a good thing. Now, I know that you don't just work with uh, women's rights issues because you have, uh, there was a young man that was uh, shot by a police officer here recently. Yes, that's correct. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so what, what, what attracted you or what drew you to that case? Yes, I, I represent uh, the family of uh, Salome Rodriguez, who was 23 years old when he was shot by an off-duty Los Angeles Police Department. A police officer, and uh, and the officer Henry Solis then fled, uh, apparently to Mexico, and oh, uh, it's reported that his father, uh, Victor Solis, uh, drove him, uh, and and there's video of them, crossing you know, going the, the through mm -hmm. customs, going to the, crossing the border, and of course now there's an, now he has been arrested, the father. And there is a fugitive warrant out for Henry Solis, as well as a murder warrant, <clears throat> and he's still at large. And I do represent the family of the victim. And uh, didn't they have video footage and everything of that? Or it's not video of the shooting. Okay. But um, 
the he has Henry Solis has been fired right. by the Los Angeles uh, police chief who has indicated, Charlie Beck did, that uh, Henry Solis has brought dishonor upon the department for the shooting and for not coming in to be questioned yeah, by run, Devonshire yeah. the next day or by the Pomona Police Department, and he's, he's at large. So, yes, I represent the family. Um, I also have another case against uh, a, a, the Los Angeles County Jail and the sheriff on behalf of an inmate who was uh, beaten. He uh, has serious mental health issues, and we allege should never have been beaten, and it's a long story, but I'll just leave it sure. at that. But we have uh, a lawsuit going mm. uh, in that regard. So, I mean, these are people who are very vulnerable to abuses of power. And again, you know, people need to be accountable. Institutions need to be accountable if they have abused that power. And that's what we are alleging in both of those situations or likely will allege uh, right. we haven't filed uh, a case yet uh, on behalf of the deceased victim. But I, I was at the you know, church with the family last week and at the burial site. And they're a very, very lovely family, and it's just heartbreaking to them because they love their son. Their son, uh, their brother, their cousin, he had no criminal history at all. And um, the uh, reports are that he was shot when... He was running away. Right. And when you look at it, uh, abuses of power have been there through, throughout all of history. Mm -hmm. um, and the abuses uh, of power are often sometimes by indi individuals or institutions which condone it. I mean, you take San Diego, for example. A right. couple of years ago, I, I represented the first woman. We filed a lawsuit and had a news conference against the mayor of San Diego, Mayor Filner. I think I remember something. Mayor of the eighth largest city in the United States. And uh, alleging, alleging that she was sexually harassed. She was the director of communications uh, for Mayor Filner. And after we did that, it had an empowering effect on other women because every day after that for 19 days, Stop. another woman came forward alleging that she had been sexually harassed or, by uh, Mayor Filner. So uh, anyway, ultimately, as a result of the mediation of our lawsuit, Mayor Filner had to step down as mayor. Right. And, uh, and women were empowered. And, you know, we're just so proud of our clients that they have courage. I mean, for me, courage, that's just, you know, in my genes, that's what I do. Were they all ultimately compensated or was it? Uh, well, the... I, I only represented that one woman right. in a lawsuit, Irene McCormick. And yes, we did reach a settlement for her. Right. And uh, she was very happy with it. And uh, all I can say is that... Um, you know, this is what it takes often because otherwise, you know, injustice goes on and on. It, you know, if it, it, it can go on if, if fear is the weapon that is often used to keep women and minorities in their so-called place, which is as doormats, I mean, as second-class citizens yeah. down. Once they break that silence and take constructive and positive action in a careful uh, but a strategic way, then often they become empowered and they can win their rights. Right. So, uh, but it's it's hard, you know, because there is a lot of fear out of there, and there are risks. There are real risks for people who who break out of that fear. So they need to really go to an attorney and get advice before they decide what they're going to do. How often do you find that these people have been intimidated? I mean, you look at the uh, Lance Armstrong witness intimidation over all that time and stuff. How often do you find that people have been intimidated or have been uh, uh, you know, attacked and really gone after and bullied uh, into silence by the time you get to them? Uh, often. And sometimes their fears are real, fact-based, and sometimes they're, they're not. They're just afraid. Right. So I think it's important to replace information, and that help with fear, and that helps to um, dissipate the fear. Yeah. And Sorry to take your word. No, it's all right. <laughs> Both at the same time. And, uh, and, and, and then to provide options. And that's what we do. I get emails from people all over this country, women desperate for help. Um, and a lot of men, too, who want justice for their daughters. Uh, and, you know, they want to know what can they do? When can they do it? How can they do it? Who 
who can help them? Can we help them? If not, can someone else help them? So they need access to justice. And I know that sometimes the police aren't going to do it. They, they uh, don't necessarily step up in every occasion. I'm sure that they're busy. I'm sure there's reasons. Uh, you go to the federal government. The federal government is very uh, careful about what they pick and choose and may not be there for you. And oftentimes there's just no resources for people that really need that justice. Well, I often say that, you know, no one, as far as women are concerned yeah. or minorities, no one's ever given us any rights. We've always had to fight to win them. And, uh, and that's what we do. Right. So uh, if we're going to, you know, hope is a child's word. So if we just sit there and hope, nothing will change. But if we get out there and take positive action to win our rights, there will be change. But it's really up to us. And, you know, uh, that's what President Obama indicated in, in his campaign. Uh, he was all about change. And How yes, we have to, but it needed, it was necessary for the people to decide that they wanted that change enough to vote for him. Right. And so now we're seeing change. It's hard fought. Oh, very hard fought. Uh, yeah. But, you know, it's what Mother Jones said, don't agonize, organize. So, for example, the gay and lesbian community has become very empowered over the years because they have organized to win the change. They are still fighting for the change. Right. They know it's not going to come unless they stand up and fight for it, as they did in Indiana, as they are elsewhere. And so that's what we do every day, support the brave individuals who are willing to stand up for that change. Now, often we can get confidential settlements, and no one will know. Right that the individual stood up. Do you, do you but see sometimes that? it's going to take a lawsuit, and where it takes a lawsuit, which is always a public document, we will do that if it's necessary and important, and if that is what our client thinks is in her or his best interest. Right. When you, and when you look at a confidential settlement, I, I, guess, I guess you must see it as a victory at the time because you took it, right? But uh, the, my question is, does it serve the greater movement to have those types of confidential settlements? You know... It's really, a, for me as an attorney, my job is to help that individual who is my client. And if she or he feels that that's in their best interest for a variety of reasons, I, I need to support my client in that. Sure. Uh, I'm not there to impose uh, an agenda for the greater good. I, I don't believe that one person should be sacrificed in order to win the greater good. If one person is helped, then I think that the group is helped. And sometimes, and often it is in their interest to be able to have a confidential settlement. And sometimes they decide, no, it's better for them to have a lawsuit. So it, it, it really depends on the individual Case facts. And these decisions are made every day. And whatever they decide is best, as long as they're making an informed decision, is what I'm going to support. Now, when you look at... Uh civil rights in terms of the, the battle that Martin Luther King Jr. was fighting and where you're really standing right now in terms of feminism. Uh, uh, is feminism the wrong term? Is no, saying feminism, yeah, is feminism is just about winning equal rights right. and equal protection under the law for women Okay, with so, men. Yeah, so when you look at that, do, which, uh, do you feel that one has moved further than the other or one's... One what? Uh, one of those movements between uh, we had people of color Oh, I see. Yeah, and mm -hmm. then now we have the women's uh, movement. Do you do you feel that one has advanced more than the other, or are they still on? Are they on equal footing, or? I don't think the women's movement is where it should be. Right. And I don't think that uh, you know we have been able to organize as a movement uh, in the most effective way. And why do you, why do you uh, well, that? I mean, you know, I think that the better organizers are those who've organized to win equal rights for uh, African Americans and uh, for gays and lesbians, even though there still is a need right. to bring lawsuits for both of those groups in order to win rights. But for women, I just don't think the movement has been as effective. I, I mean, I'm not a grassroots organizer. I'm a lawyer and I do lawsuits. Right. Uh, although I did organize or help to organize a protest against Bill Cosby in Denver, yeah. which is <laughs> online and which was quite, uh, quite passionate. 
Uh, and I might add, I think, very successful. I was very proud of those women who came forward and also men who, who picketed. And that but, will likely go to settlement. Well, but, I, I guess, but I guess that, you can well, but gen, well, gen, you know, but I'm saying in general, yeah. you know, I, I just think that the organizers of the movement need to do a better job uh, in, in speaking out against injustices. However, you know, everybody, this is a war that's being fought on many fronts. And I mean, think, I just think they can do more. And what do you think are the impediments for women? Because I know, like, I teach seminars. I've taught all over the world and thousands of people. When I hear the biggest things that uh, I hear from women is that one of their challenges is stepping up, yet not becoming too masculine and keeping their femininity as they're looking to express themselves. Okay, I don't know world. what all that means. In other words, do they're not fitting the gender stereotype of what a female's supposed to be? Well, well, the, no, That's what it sounds like. You know, it sounds as though you're saying, okay, they're afraid that, they're not going to stay within the female stereotype of being what? Wearing a dress, you know, kind of being very polite and very cautious and, and kind of within that little tight little boundary. Um, kind but, of. But I mean, okay, yeah, it's but, them saying it to me. You know, it's like yeah, I'm saying. Yeah, I know. Well, then we got to get rid of the stereotypes because it's not, first of all, stereotypes are dangerous and um, restrictive. And uh, they actually can end up you know, with women being denied employment opportunities, educational opportunities, financial opportunities, um, and becoming victims of violence. So. Well, I think that, like when you, when you look at assertiveness and all those things that would come with, uh, that some might attribute to being masculine qualities. Well, that um, would be a stereotype. Yeah. Some, I think some, uh, yeah, well, there's I, always some who are, have stereotypes about minorities and about women. And so we need to educate uh, and the point, and you know, we see women being forced into stereotypical roles all over the world. But and so that's why it will be helpful if we can have a, the the election of a woman president. Yeah, I hope so because that yeah. will help to eliminate many stereotypes. Right. Uh, so that women are not just the wives of, of, of presidents and not just going around kissing babies and, you know. Uh, I think that's all the presidents do. <laughs> well, uh, you know, times. well, do you know what I mean? I and do. And uh, it's all, but. Right. Yeah, but I'm saying we need to have the commander in chief be a woman. Sure. Hopefully a woman who cares about women's rights. And, um, you know, we need more, we need equal participation of women uh, in state legislatures in the United States Congress, you know, as we say, are as we not the, seeing that now? Women's is it, places uh, in the House, the White House, yeah. the House of Representatives. Um, so no, we so we don't we don't have equal representation politically. We don't have equal representation financially. Employment. Sure, yeah. We have a you know the glass ceiling. A lot of women can see to the top, but they're not up there not equal numbers as CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. That makes no sense to me either, by the way. That, like, and, and there's a lot of sexual harassment that goes on, and that is a barrier to the enjoyment of equal employment opportunity. That's actually one of the number one things we do in our law firm is fighting sexual harassment for victims. And that means that they're in a no-win situation. If they say yes, then ultimately, you know, the boss may get tired of them, and then they don't have a job. Right. If they say no, then the boss may go into ego shock. And then they don't have a job. So it, it's a barrier. And, you know, this is, it, it, we still have a long way to go for women. And the reasons where and why we don't yet enjoy equal rights. Okay, got to take last break. We'll be right back. Okay, so a big question for you. Um, in a male-dominated, like so we're saying that in the in the workplace, we've got uh, it's a male-dominated environment. We're saying from in terms of uh, salary, in terms of uh, those types of things, in terms of positions of power, we do see more and more women are coming in and they're uh, making an impact. Um, my personal opinion is oftentimes women can be much better than the men that are in there in terms of managing, in terms of uh, making things work. Women I've noticed are better, much better multitaskers. I've had uh, a lot of women on teams that I've run. From from a male perspective, what do you think, and I know that you're an attorney, you're, but what do you think uh, men can do? Because when you, you if you get a bunch of guys together, they're going to have a certain tone of conversation. What should they be doing to change that ton of conversation when women are in the workplace, uh, in your opinion? I, I know it goes outside of what you... Well, no, because employment discrimination is 
uh, you know, can be proven in many ways. Like, right. what are the conversations that men have had about women in the workplace? Well, How have I mean, they treated women in the workplace? The well, I, I think one of the things that they can do, and I am action-oriented, so thank you for that question, okay. is if someone says something that is sexist and discriminatory, even if all the guys are together, then somebody needs to speak up about that. Uh, it's not okay, because unless guys have the courage to have a conversation with each other about, well, that's not really true about women. Well, that's They're not, not all like that, or, you know what, I really would, you know, I don't think you should just be saying those sexual things about right. one of our coworkers or our boss or our... It, it's not going to change, okay, and... I, 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 I've seen all kinds of things in the workplace. I've seen sure. women subjected to being forced to watch pornography, to having their breasts grabbed, to have their butts <laughs> pinched, to uh, you know being raped in the workplace. To um, it's it's amazing that it still goes on in 2015, and like we have a whole IT department here in my law firm where we're constantly downloading for evidence in our case. Uh, some of the emails, the Instagram photos, the everything that, <laughs> the texts, the, the the photos that have been sent to our clients in the workplace, our female clients uh, of a sexual nature, which help us to prove a sexual harassment case. So, what can they do? You know, I think it's it's it comes from the top that uh, those at the top, the boss and the executives, they need to understand that the law is that. A workplace must be free of sexual harassment because that's a denial of equal employment opportunity. That means innuendos. And that, that means, means conversations. That you know, have. it's in their best interest yeah. to make sure not only that the policy is posted on the wall, which it often is, but it's actually enforced in the workplace to be training, to be monitoring. Otherwise, that business is at risk of being sued. And we have one wonderful uh, numbers, uh, you know, very large numbers amounts of money for victims of sexual harassment. So it's in their economic interest, sure. their legal interest to clean up their workplace. And so, yeah, because I mean, whether you get men together or women together, there's always going to be conversations that you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't want to go into the workplace. So the question is, you know, uh, I guess you answered it, just clean it up on, on all sides in terms of what's happening there. In yeah, it's in the business's that. interest to do that. Right. Yeah. Otherwise, they may be getting a call from me. Right. Which is never <laughs> never pleasant for from their point of view. That was a perfect look at camera moment. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they may right. Be getting a call from it's me. like, <laughs> oh my, you know, you just you you know, I dropped that letter, and you can almost hear what's going on <laughs> in their office, three thousand miles away. Oh my god. Uh, and uh, so yeah, and and we don't do that unless we have a lot of evidence. Right. We make sure we have the evidence before we send the letter or before we file the lawsuit. And then they know, you know what, it would have been better if we had not allowed this. In the first place. In the first place. Right. Because so, otherwise now we're going to have to pay. Because my belief is that the cost of the wrong, the cost of the injustice should not be borne by the victim. It must be borne by the wrongdoer. And the victim must be compensated for having had that wrong inflicted on her or him. And by the way, we've represented men who have been the victims of sexual harassment as well. Sure Years ago, we won a $5 million verdict for a man who was sexually harassed by another man at his workplace. So men can be victims of this as well. Hmm. And then uh, I, I was just kind of sitting in the power and the impact of that statement that the cost of the wrong should not be Born, born by the victim. Yeah. Exactly. And, you know, we fight against pregnancy discrimination. We won a big, you know, multi-million dollar verdict for Hunter Tylo many years ago when she was uh, yep. the victim of uh, pregnancy discrimination by Melrose Place. Mm -hmm. uh, and we proved that you can be bold, you can be beautiful, you can be pregnant, and you can do your job even as an actress all at the same time. You even worked in the title of a soap opera there. Yeah, you knew, right. You knew you well, got. she was on Bold and oh, Beautiful. Was she really? That's why oh. I mentioned that. <laughs> and so, you know, but... These are important issues because they're economically, women then suffer if they are sexually harassed or if they're a victim of pregnancy discrimination or age discrimination, which is a very big issue, especially for older women uh, and also older men in the workplace. Now, one, one question is, uh, you, the, the subtitle of your book was, and how you could win your own battles. Yes, because I'm very big on empowerment. 
In other words, I have little life lessons at the end about, okay, here's what you can learn from this case to help you in your life. Uh, are, uh, even like, if you're not a lawyer, it's not a book written for lawyers. It's a book for written people for people who are not lawyers, but you know who so want to win in, some justice. If somebody's in a uh, not a lawyer and they're in a David Goliath situation, um, I don't have a woman's name for David, so I can't insert it. But uh, I just call them Davida. Yeah. Davida, okay. Davida, and David okay. and Goliath sounds like Velveeta, but no, it's a different okay. thing. But Davida, <laughs> Davida uh-huh. and David. Uh, how, how does somebody go about winning their own battle? Like if Well, I mean, you know, sometimes you need a lawyer and sometimes you don't. Right. Sometimes you can go to small claims court and you can win. And we did the haircut cases. We did the, you know, little girls charge more for their haircuts than little boys. And we uh, won thought, that. We I did, we I did, you because we did the, the yeah. sex discrimination <laughs> cases, Saks Fifth Avenue, where women were being charged for more for dry, for alterations than men were being charged, and we, we won a uh, change in their policy nationwide. Uh, you know, things sound ridiculous. We did like, so many that, of yeah. these cases, the dry cleaning cases many decades ago, where uh, women were being charged for, for dry, dry cleaning, cleaning right? more yes. than men were. I mean, but some of these cases, if, for example, if an individual finds they're in that, in that situation, they can go to small claims court, and they don't need a lawyer, and they can win. Uh, and the other side can't have a lawyer either. But in every county in this country, there are uh, bar associations, and they can refer people to plaintiffs' lawyers. Plaintiffs are people who represent victims throughout this country, and they can often find access to justice and people who will help them to vindicate their on rights there. On consignment or something? Do they do that? Often, on, that a conti- often on a contingency, contingency That's what I meant. Which, I is, which means that the individual victim doesn't have to pay anything up front, and if the lawyer wins something for them in the end, they will get the lawyer will get a share depending on what the contingency is. Right. And if they don't win anything, then the client doesn't owe them anything. Right. So, and that's a great thing because otherwise, individuals, the kind of individuals that I would represent, uh, they would never be able to have access to justice if they had to pay my hourly rate. Right. And that would be impossible. So it's better that I mean, most cases are on a contingency. Nothing. Up front, and only if you know we win, do they owe us anything? Right. But you win a lot. Uh, that's our that's our reputation. <laughs> yeah, we have a great track record. We're very proud of that track record. We couldn't do it without our clients. Now, in most cases, would uh, a victim uh, be better off going to the police or the DA or going and finding a lawyer first? Well, I represent a lot of victims of crime. Right. And 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 still do. Yeah. And. Um, uh, they come to me, for example, rape victims. Mm-hmm. I have a lot of those. And uh, they want to know, well, okay, what do I do now? Okay. The district attorney does not represent a victim. The district attorney represents the people of the county or the people of the state. And the, it, the victim is entitled to her own private attorney. For example, I represent a victim of Darren Sharper, uh, who just pled no contest. I'm not sure. NFL. Oh, NFL. Yeah. And um, and to raping and sexually sure. assaulting, drugging certain women. Uh, anyway, victims are entitled to have their own attorney to advise them as to their rights and responsibilities in the criminal justice system. And often we will file civil lawsuits as well uh, to seek compensation from the alleged perpetrator of the crime against them. Right. So I actually think it's a good idea to, to come early to an attorney to get advice to help them through the system so they know what they should do, what they should not do, you know, preserve evidence, don't destroy evidence. You know, this is what, you know, just to know what an arraignment is, to know what they're expected to do, if they should go to court, they shouldn't go to court. Because often there's a victim advocate for them. That person is not an attorney provided by the DA's office. Sometimes they can't get information about what's happening in their criminal case. I can get that information for them. And it just helps them to know they've got a support person going through it. Yeah, I, I imagine. I mean, I, I know that uh, if they don't, uh, what it says, if somebody's extorting you, for example, the longer you let that extortion go on, the harder it is to, to fight. Yeah, and well, it's good to know. You don't want to make mistakes. You don't want to get involved mm-hmm. in crimes yourself because even if you had good intentions, pushed into it, yeah. you know, we know about the road to hell being paved with good intentions. So it's good mm-hmm. always to get advice early on. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, I mean, just actually last week, I was able to, to speak to a district attorney and try to find out what's going on in that case and why isn't it filed and is it going to be filed and what else do you need from the victim and all of that. And I think that's it was a big help to the victim. So, you know, we, we do all of this because, again, it's all about empowering women. We don't want them to be afraid if they're rape and sexual assault victims, for example, to go to the police, to go have their case considered. Sometimes victims are attacked in the media by the powerful, and there's a case I'm thinking of right now, which I cannot name, okay. but which that's happening because nobody knows yet I'm representing the victim. Right. And it's to be supportive of her throughout this so that she can get to the end that's very and get as much justice that. because it's very unfair what's happening to her. That's like what they do to you on the But we stand, do have right? a plan about what's going to happen next, and um, so we'll see. Yeah, I mean, when you when you step up for something, you yeah. put everything on the line. It could right. cost you your career, I would imagine. But she's still there, your... and she's still hanging in, and I think it's a help to her that she can call and talk to me about it and know that they're, you know, we're going to fight for justice at the right time in the right place in the right way. Mm. She just needs to hang in there, and she knows she's got a lifeline here that she can talk with me, and she can talk to a therapist, and she can get through this. Wow. And uh, in terms of, so you take a lot of the, the women's cases on that you take on uh, via contingency? Well, um, I mean, I, I, it's, it's, I can't talk about what I do in any individual yeah. case, but yes, I would say most of our cases are on a contingency. Some are on limited contingency, some retain the rest in a contingency, some are pro bono, but I mean, most, most I would say are on a contingency, but it depends on the case. Yeah. When, when you look out, uh, what do you see as being the ideal future for, from a women's rights perspective? What's the like, ideal future will be equal rights and equal protection under the law. Mm. How far do you think we the are? The ideal would be that I would never have to do a case again because there would be no injustice. I don't think I'm going to see that in my lifetime. Okay. But Because um, when Martin Luther King Jr. said, I've seen the other side of the mountain, it's coming... Uh, I may not make it there with you, but it's coming. And he didn't make it there with us. No, he didn't. And I'm not going to make it there either because we still have so much injustice. I mean, when I started out almost 40 years ago, I had no idea that 40 years later there would be such a need still to fight these battles, to win these, these victories. Every day there are injustices. Every day I have people crying and, you know, I have my tables are such that I can, people can feel free to just cry. Yeah, I see your oh, tissues. Tears. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, I say first we cry and then we fight. Yeah. And there are real injustices against victims. And the extent and the scope and the severity of it is beyond anything I ever imagined. And that's why I feel I have a duty to do what I do. I have no right not to do it. I have to do this. I am driven. I confess to that. And I want to do this, and I want others to help. What are you most grateful for in regards to the path that you've chosen? I'm just grateful that I have had the opportunity to do this, and the ability to do it, and the support to do it, and the wonderful partners and associates and other lawyers across the country who are supporting me in doing this. Um, so I'm just... Uh, you know, a kid from a row house in Philadelphia with parents with an, who had an eighth grade education, who had no money, no car. We had nothing except we had each other, and I had a great public school education and teachers who believed in me even more than I believed in myself. And I'm just a fortunate to have been able to be where I am to help other people. So that's why I have a duty to give back. And that's what I want to do for as long as I have this gift of life. And if I can do it from the great beyond, I'll still be doing it there as well, if there is one. That's a good place to end. Thank you so much. Thank you. I really appreciate it. We'll see you on the next episode. And until then, love deeply, shine brightly, make every day an extraordinary adventure.